Welcome to today's presentation on Kame for Cameo and CSA. Uh, my name is Jamie Bogret. I'm the Director of Application Services, Student Affairs and Recruitment here at ACOM, along with my two incredible staff, Jessica James and Erin Helbling. Uh, as a reminder, hopefully you've all received emails, but given the growing and uncertain path of the current coronavirus public health crisis and the need for all of our medical professions to be available to serve our patients and our communities, ACOM has decided to cancel its annual conference, Educating Leaders 2020, scheduled for March 25th through the 27th in Washington, D.C. This is, includes canceling our pre-conference workshops and council meetings. We do plan on having some events virtually, but those events are very much in the planning stages. Please keep your eyes out for upcoming emails about which events are still to be held virtually. On a related note, we're also working in conjunction with CSA and Cameo leadership on whether to hold council meetings during that week and what the modified agendas might be. We have already begun working on online voting for leadership positions. If you haven't already, please let us know via, via the survey if you haven't already let us know via the surveys of your interest, please notify Jessica or myself by close of business Friday, March 21st of your interest. For Cameo, we have seats open for the vice chairperson and secretary. And for CSA, we have the COSGP liaison elect and the vice chairperson available. Today, we're gonna talk about a few things. We're gonna start with the current ACOMA cycle update where Jessica is gonna give you some uh, statistics. Uh, Aaron's gonna lead us in all of the exciting recruitment initiatives we have going on. Jessica will talk about the exciting ACOMA cycle updates for 2020, 2021, which will open in May. Uh, I'll come back and talk about some initiatives we have uh, that we're looking at for future cycles. And then we'll answer any questions and uh, solicit feedback from you. I'm going to turn it over now to talk about the ACOMAS update for this cycle. Uh, thanks, Jamie. We will start with a brief update of our ACOMAS application numbers for the 2019 to 2020 ACOMAS cycle. As of March 1st, 2020, ACOMAS had received 23,269 submitted applicants, which is a 5.42 increase over March 1st in the prior cycle. There were 204,758 submitted designations or individual applications to medical schools. That is a 4.5% increase over March 2019. Each applicant submitted an average of 8.79 designations. That's a decrease of 0 0.08 designations per applicant or just under negative 1%. Since the 2018-19 cycle, we also added two additional ACOMAS programs for a total of 42 programs. Those programs were VCOM Louisiana and the California Health Sciences University College. The cycle officially closes in less than one month on April, 12, uh, April 10th, excuse me, because we are nearly at the close of the cycle and most school deadlines have already passed, we don't expect to see very much change in these numbers before April 10th. If you're not already aware, we routinely survey our fellow health professions colleagues to benchmark our growth against what others are seeing. Other health professions are seeing declines in their applicant pool across the board with a few exceptions like veterinary medicine and podiatry. Uh, this is a trend that's been occurring for the past couple years. Um, and one of the reasons why we are uh, cautiously optimistic about our, uh, our growth, allopathic medicine also saw a slight growth in the prior cycle, but they're growing at a slightly slower rate than osteopathic medicine. To put this cycle's numbers into context, we've pulled some data that compares this cycle with the prior four years. We're calling it our five-year ACOMA snapshot. Um, here we've compiled, compiled the volume of submitted applicants to ACOMA over the past five years. We have data for the current cycle um, in green, that top bar, through March 1st, 2020. You can see that we're trending slightly higher in the current cycle than we were in prior cycles. The overlap of those lower trend lines, that light blue, the red, and the teal, shows how we remained virtually flat in the 2016 through 2018 application cycle. This year, we've seen the highest number of ACOMAS applicants ever apply through the service. By February 1st of this year, we already exceeded the total number of applicants that we had, we had received in the entire cycle last year. 
This is the same view, but with submitting designations rather than applicants. Again, we've seen incremental growth in the current cycle um, over the prior cycles. The first three cycles between 2016 and 18, so those lower bars again, show stagnation and negative growth. Again, as of February 1st, 2020, we had exceeded the total number of designations uh, received then throughout the entire cycle last year. Um, so we're already ahead of where we ended the, at, the, at the prior cycle. This year will mark the highest number of designations ever received by Thomas, and it's the first year. We will have received over 200,000 submitted designations. This chart shows the percent change in applicants and designations for the past five years. Submitted applicants are in dark blue and designations are in teal. You can more clearly see uh, that on this chart, we've had some ups and downs in the recent past, um, which again is one of the reasons why we're, we're pretty happy about the, the growth that we've seen this cycle. Um, this cycle's growth is 5.4% and 4.5% um, applicants and designations respectively. Looking at the dark blue submitted applicants first, we've seen some slow but positive growth each cycle. The first three cycles are virtually flat with growth not exceeding 1.5%. For submitted designations in teal, we saw negative growth between 2015 um, and the 2018 uh, cycle years. We ended the 2018 to 19 cycle up by 6.42%, which was the first time we'd experienced um, significant growth in three years. Awesome. So I will pick it up from here to discuss some of our recruitment initiatives uh, that our team at ACOM has been hard at work on over the past year. So to kick us off, we'll talk a little bit about where we've been uh, this past year. We wanted to highlight all of the events we had a presence at. So on behalf of all 36 of our institutions and the osteopathic profession, we attended 15 events, most of them being national conferences. Given the volume of recruiting and national, excuse me, given the volume of regional and national recruiting each of your institutions does in a given year, the number may seem small to you, but our team was strategic in choosing the events to attend, using data to drive our efforts and ensure that your institutions are highlighted and remain the focal point of our efforts. Many of you are involved in our NAAHP regional conferences, whether that be on admissions review panel sessions, or in other ways, we appreciate your contributions and receive great feedback from our advising partners on these sessions. We have and will continue to track the students and advisors that we interact with at all of these events to decide where we should focus our energy and resources, measuring the ROI for both your schools and our team here at ACOM. So with that said, where we're headed, um, for the remainder of spring 2020 and the beginning of summer 2020, we do have seven events on our calendar, uh, including but not limited to SNMA, AMSA, NHMA, and NAAHP. Um, obviously, we will continue to, to watch the coronavirus and anything that gets canceled. The UMD fair was canceled as of this morning, um, so it, it, we are down to six events for this spring. Um, and then you'll see on the right hand side, pending budget approval for the next year, we intend to continue our efforts and attend some new events that target both underrepresented populations, as well as expanding our reach to high school students at the USA Science and Engineering Festival. I know I mentioned NAAHP, um, and on behalf of our team, we did want to just spend a moment going over to, and reminding you of the resources our team is contributing to the NAAHP national meeting on behalf of all 36 of our schools. Our goal in doing so is to give each and every one of our schools visibility, present a united front and message for osteopathic medicine, and hopefully save each of you from having to spend on individual sponsorship efforts. For reference, following the April 2019 Cameo meeting, membership was surveyed to gauge feedback and interest in the way we collectively moved forward with NAAHP meeting, planning, and sponsorship. The goal of our survey was always to ensure that we coordinated collaboration with our schools and provide the best experience to advisors at a low financial cost to you. Those results uh, were shared with all of Cameo, and it was decided that NAAHP and ACOM would move forward to best determine what a, whatever NAAHP might need for their conference. And then at the Cameo meeting in October, 
ACON presented what we would be doing. So what we are doing uh, is hosting the new advisors workshop on Wednesday, June 24th at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on behalf of all 36 of our schools. During this workshop, our team will have five minutes to address the advisors and introduce them to osteopathic medicine, highlighting all 36 of our comms. And advisors who attend this workshop will receive a new advisors toolkit from ACOM, which will include fast facts about osteopathic medicine and any helpful information they may need to empower them to advise students to choose DO. ACOM is going to also host an interactive exhibit booth showcasing all of our schools in osteopathic medicine throughout the entire week of NAAHP. I personally will coordinate um, with each of you some time for your admissions officers and staff to come by our table, representing your institutions at our booth. The booth will include, include an interactive to see a wall that not only encourages conversation, but creates feedback loops with our advisors and excites participants. ACOM has also reduced all of your registration fees for the health professions fair registration by $100. So when you register, when and if you register for the health professions fair that happens on Saturday, um, your fee should have a $100 um, discount. So the Choose Dio website is our next point of conversation. As you all know, this uh, page was designed specifically to meet the needs of prospective students. It's home to all of our pre-med resources that we hope you will and continue to refer students to um, when they have questions. Tuesdio.org is home to our Tuesdio Explorer, our student guide to osteopathic medicine, information on what osteopathic medicine is, each of our individual comm pages, instructions on how to apply, and upcoming events at each of your schools that you can submit through the event submission form, um, which is down in this presentation on the right-hand side, um, and much more. It's also home to our blog, um, but most importantly, I really did want to highlight the Explorer. Our theme continues to be most proud of our Choose Dio Explorer, which is our searchable medical school database for all DO programs. The Explorer is intended to serve those who wish to join the growing community of osteopathic physicians by providing information on school locations, dual degree options, institutional campus setting, mean overall GPA and MCAT scores for enrolled students, and application deadlines. All of the data reflected in the Choose Explorer is collected via our student guide survey and self-reported by each of your institutions. Um, we did launch this in June of 2019, and thus far we've had over 4,000 users um, register for the Explorer. We've gotten a lot of great feedback from our advising community and pre-meds, um, and we will continue to make enhancement to that as data becomes available. I did mention the student guide briefly, um, which is our free online downloadable PDF version. Um, and also currently is in print uh, that each of you will receive a number of copies of. Uh, I wanted to remind everyone that as technology improves and documentation becomes out of date as soon as it's printed, we have decided that we will no longer be printing the student guide. Um, the student guide is our old CIB. Um, we will continue to keep it housed on choosedio.org. Um, in a PDF that students can download, but we will no longer be printing that. Virtual Medical School Expos. Uh, so since 2018, August of 2018, ACOM has hosted four virtual medical school expos on our career eco platform. We've seen a total of 7,250 attendees attend at least one of our virtual events and 14,000 pre-medical students have registered for at least one of our four virtual fairs. So this means that if your comm has participated in these fairs, you do have access to names and contact information for over 14,000 prospective students. Of the 7,250 virtual expo attendees, 34.5% or 2,503 attendees have submitted an ACOMIS application. As of February 10th of 
86% of submitted applicants for the 2019-2020 application cycle answered online or virtual career expo to the question, how did you learn about osteopathic medicine? We are always taking both feedback gathered via post-event surveys from our attendees and our members to improve these events and make sure that our schools get the most out of them and that prospective students get the information they are seeking by attending. As you all know, in addition to our virtual events, we continue to host two CO medical school expos. Historically, we've hosted one each year in conjunction with the ACOM annual conference, Educating Leaders. And this year, we took the show on the road to Atlanta, Georgia to host an expo on Georgia Tech's campus. We chose Atlanta based on data that we had compared to the number of applicants to DO schools from undergraduate institutions to the number of applicants to MD schools from the same undergraduate institutions. So using this data, we identified schools that had the highest differences in students applying to MD versus DO schools and used that data to drive our decision to take the event to Atlanta. And although we had to cancel our March 25th event, um, we did plan to implement a change to the event to benefit each of you which was that we included a release statement in registration that asked registrants if we could release their contact information to our institutions, meaning that despite whether they attended the event in person, you would get their contact information and also don't necessarily have to worry about collecting it during the recruitment fair. We were and continue to be very excited about hosting this event with Dr. Cottle as our keynote and we will be working with Dr. Cottle to see if we can do an online webinar series with her uh, in hopes that we will reach even more students than one in-person event and or, um, excuse me, that one event could have um, and or invite her to participate in future in-person events. Since April of 2017, we've had 1,645 pre-medical students register for one of our in-person events and 727 of those registrants have attended. Of those attendees, 279 or 38% have submitted an application. As always, we will continue to monitor these numbers given that many attendees may not have been ready to apply just yet. So this past year, we began to revamp our email marketing campaigns to continue to engage our prospective students. We rebranded the messaging so that they reflect Choose DO and have used the emails to highlight our new blog posts, video content, and share other resources like the Choose DO Explorer. Our email campaigns remain a work in progress and we are continually, continually evaluating the campaign's success via our delivery, open, and click-through rates. We would like to show you some of the data we have collected on our email marketing from this past year. To date, we've seen just under 9,600 unique clicks or visits to choosedo.org via our emails. And the data reflected on the following slides is reflective of emails sent from ACOM from July 2019 to February of 2020. Before I get into the data, I did want to go over the four tiers that we currently have our campaign broken into. And those tiers are prospects, inquiries, in-progress applicants, and applicants. Each tier or group of contacts um, has content that is designed specifically for them. So if you're a prospect who doesn't know about osteopathic medicine yet, you're not going to be getting the same information that as the in-progress applicant um, might be getting. And keep in mind that a contact may progress through the different stages. So if an inquiry begins or opens in a comas application, then they automatically change tiers and become an in-progress applicant, triggering an automated um, email message from our team. So who are our prospects? Prospects are pre-medical students who have taken the MCAT. Our call to action for these prospects is to explore osteopathic medicine, the degree, and what our profession has to offer. We wanna educate them on the DO pathway and begin to sell them, helping them choose DO. As we continue to build our nurture campaign out, our hope is to have one email per month going to our prospects. Who are our inquiries? An inquiry has raised their hand to say, hey, I'm interested in osteopathic medicine and I'd really like some more information. So they sign up on choosedio.org, they attend a virtual expo, a choosedio medical school expo, perhaps we've met them at a recruitment event, 
or maybe they've signed up for the Choose Dio Explorer. What we do know is that they have some knowledge of what osteopathic medicine is. So our call to action for them is drive to apply, choose DO. Who are our in-progress applicants? This one may be pretty self-explanatory, but an in-progress applicant is anyone who's open in a COMIS application. Our call to action for them is pretty simple. Finish your application and here are some tips to get you there. Who are our applicants? And again, another self-explanatory one perhaps. Um, but we want them to choose one of your institutions over an MD school if given the opportunity to attend medical school. So they have completely submitted their application and our goal is to get them to choose DO. Um, I keep saying that, but it's all about retention for our applicants. So with all that said, um, now that you know who we're talking to, we've got some data points that we've gleaned from this year's campaign. We're using this data to drive the changes we will make for the campaign for the upcoming cycle. In the perspective and inquiry stages, you'll see the three emails that were queued for each group. On the far left, you're seeing how many of each email were sent. And then you'll see the light blue shows how many individuals opened the emails. The dark blue reflects how many individuals clicked through to choose DO or the link that was provided in the email. And the red shows how many individuals elected to opt out from our email messaging. Click-through rates are an important metric to us because this is where we see lead generation. If our prospective students are reading our emails but failing to take the action that we want, aka visiting Choose DO or advancing to become an in-progress applicant, then we have some work to do. Our open rates are important for brand awareness and building relations, relationships, um, but not so much for lead generation. For reference, generally speaking, the average open rate for an email campaign is 17.92%. Do keep in mind that every industry has different averages. Um, for our inquiries, we are averaging at an open rate of about 26%. And for our prospects, our average open rate right now is about 25.76%. So our team is excited to use these benchmarks to clean up our messaging, making the calls to action more concise, relatable, and exciting all in an effort to increase our, increase our click-through rates or that dark blue area on the chart. So we're looking at the same data points for our in-progress um, and applicants. Here we're seeing an average open rate of 43.97% for our in-progress applicants and 56% for our submitted applicants. These numbers are obviously higher and make a little more sense given that these are some of our highly engaged consumers. They've already begun or submitted an application, so they know who we are, they trust us, and they're interested in what we have to say. Again, our goal here with these two is apply and retention, and how can we support them through their application process, ensure that when given the opportunity, they choose GEO. So I know we've mentioned them a time or two, and I've worked closely with our recruitment advisory committee to build the content for these, but with the launch of our new Choose GEO website, uh, we knew we would need to boost SEO or search engine optimization. By blogging consistently, our goal is to give Google and other search engines new context to index our page. We also want to engage our audience and excite them with fun, fresh, relatable content. We want free medical students to connect with our brand, and our blog allows us to show the personal side of Choose Geo, building trust. We did incorporate two of our blog posts into our email campaigns this past year, and we are working to do more of this in the coming cycle. Our goal is to have one alumni spotlight per tier of email marketing so that as a student progresses through their life cycle as an applicant, they're getting four featured storylines with the successes of your graduates in our profession. Our one alumni spotlight this year is a future orthopedic surgeon, and so far, this post has seen 1,500 page views. In addition to alumni spotlights, we've worked on piece, pieces such as the five essentials for preparing for medical school as told by one of your students, which saw over 3,000 page views, and pieces from pre-meds who have attended one of our events, encouraging other pre-meds to do the same. That one saw over 200 page views. As always, we are more than open to your ideas, and although we have quite a few posts in the works, if there are more that you'd like to see featured, please don't hesitate to send them our way. So our geo-targeting campaigns were new for us and our team this year. 
um, and one that we are hoping to continue to expand throughout the 2020 to 2021 cycle. Geotargeting involves social media and Google ads for students at top medical school and undergraduate theater institutions. Together with our research department, ACOM staff collected data on the top producing undergraduate schools to MD and DO schools and began a geo marketing project with our Marcom team. Marcom is marketing and communications. Thus far, we've had close to 10,000 click throughs, over 1,000 registrants to the Choose Geo Explorer, and 275 applicant, applicants directly apply from our geo targeting campaign. And I did want to let you know about our Navigating Acomas for Advisors um, webinar that is coming up. Um, I plan to send registration out today, um, but we know how important our advising community is to the success of our efforts and future students. So we're hosting this on April 15th. We did one last year, received great feedback from both advisors um, and you all. So we're excited to offer this again. So we encourage you to encourage your advisors to join us. Um, we will be going over important changes to the cycle that um, Jamie and Jessica are about to go over, but the new advisor release statement, the updated UAP disclaimer language, and then liaison will come on and uh, go over the pre-run reports that they can pull from the UAP. Uh, so I will send registration links out to you all. Um, and we ask that you encourage any advisors that maybe have questions or need an update before we head into the cycle to join us. And that's all I've got for you, I think, regarding recruitment efforts at this time. We always welcome feedback and suggestions if you feel um, we may be missing anything. Our recruitment advisory committee meets monthly to discuss our initiatives and it has been awesome at providing new ideas and advice. Um, and we certainly look forward to all that we can accomplish in the coming year together. And with that, I'll pass it off to Jamie and Jessica. Thanks, Erin. Um, so we've given you a lot of information about what we've been busy with this past year and what our current cycle application numbers look like. Um, just we want to switch gears uh, for a moment to talk about the upcoming application cycle, um, the timeline, some key updates about enhancements, fees, and what we're working on for beyond the 2020-21 cycle. So there are a lot of important dates coming up in the next few months for the 2020-2021 Select 20s application cycle. And we want to take this opportunity to highlight a few of those milestones. On March 17th, which is next Tuesday, uh, it's the deadline for program configuration. That means someone from each institution needs to review uh, their program pages, prerequisites, and program-specific questions in ACOMA, make any necessary updates for the new cycle, and then submit the page for review. So submitting your page for review must happen before your program is approved to go live in ACOMAS for the next cycle. Meeting this deadline is important to ensure your program is ready to launch with the application. And information about completing configuration and accessing the pre-launch environment, which is where configuration takes place, um, was emailed to users with access in um, January. But please reach out to uh, me if you have any questions or concerns about meeting this deadline. I'm also happy to re-forward that email in case you can't find it in your inbox from January. On April 10th, the current 2019-2020 cycle closes. However, most schools have deadlines prior to this date. On May 5th, we launched the 2020-21 application cycle. Uh, applicants may pay and submit as early as May 5th, but similar to prior cycles, schools won't begin to receive applicant data through web admit until June 15th. On June 15th, advisors will also begin receiving applicant data for the 2020-21 cycle. Advisors, however, won't begin to receive decision data until January 15th, 2021. On May 15th, ACOMAS uh, makes the competing offers accepted report available through WebAdmit. That means that schools will be able to see the names of the 2019-20 cycle applicants who are mapped to the offer accepted decision code at your institution and at least uh, one other school. To ensure the reports populate accurately for your school and others, we ask that you report the students in the offer accepted decision code through WebAdmit by that May 15th deadline. 
This year, we uh, received positive feedback on the new deferral process that we rolled out um, for, the, for the past cycle, which captured more deferred students to copy over into the next cycle. So we plan to keep the same process this year and ask that schools report deferrals by August 27th. So those are the upcoming dates for the for the next application. Um, we want to share some of the more important uh, enhancements for the upcoming cycle as well. Before we list all of those out, uh, we want to share how we got to this point. Um, we followed a similar process uh, as to other cycles to, to finalize that enhancement list for implementation. So in May 2019 um, through October 2019, we collected ideas from Cameo, advisors, students, staff, and other uh, medical school stakeholders. This year, we had increased engagement from advisors and others outside of the immediate Cameo community. We then asked the ECOMAS Advisory Committee to prioritize the ideas of high, medium, or low, or um, not prioritize at all, they don't want it. Um, we wanted to know how important each idea was to your admission process. In November and December of 2019, we consulted with liaison to determine how hard or how many resources it would take to build and implement these changes. So for example, if something was a small request and a high priority, it was a no brainer that we would implement it. We typically push to get the um, higher priority items done for this cycle with liaison. We continued to work through the updated list with the Comus Advisory Committee in December to ensure there wasn't anything vital that we couldn't save for future cycles. Uh, then throughout the beginning of this year, liaison began building out the enhancements in the platform. So the ACOMAS Advisory Committee then participated in a testing exercise with ACOM staff to ensure those enhancements had been built correctly and met our requirements. So we continue to test those items as liaison builds them through the, basically through April, April before that May 5th launch. So this might be a good time to add that there, uh, that the ACOMAS Ideas Portal which uh, we use to collect everyone's requests, has a new home. Uh, we transitioned to uh, the Qualtrics survey tool, which I know some of you use on your campuses. So some of our surveys were rebuilt at different URLs. The new ideas portal URL is at the bottom of the screen and it's very, very long. I apologize about that. We've also linked, uh, linked the ideas portal in this month's upcoming admissions and recruitment roundup. So look out for that in case you'd like to bookmark it. And as always, if you have an idea, um, and don't want to look for that URL, you can just email one of us and on staff and we can help you get um, your idea into the portal. So as you can see, this process was long and would not have been possible without the hard work of the nine members of the Comus Advisory Committee this year. Um, they really, they brought us ideas, they prioritized them and they tested them um, and that spent countless hours on conference calls talking about them. So we want to take a moment to recognize the enormous time commitment they've made to help us advance the COMAS this year. So thank you to Brooke Birdsong, who served as the chair of the group, um, Andrea Saitirsky Acosta, who's our Kamea chair, LaDonna Davidson, who's our Kamea secretary, Megan Farley from VCOM, Janine Holland of Rowan, Leon Hunter from Pacific Northwest, um, Courtney Lewis from Burrell, uh, Jeanette Martin of Idaho, and Steve Toplin from Toro, New York. Their work and advice has been really vital to this process, so thank you. So finally, this is the list of some of 10 key enhancements for the upcoming cycle. There's a larger list of over 60 additional enhancements that Liaison has rolled out during the prior cycle or will roll out shortly onto the platform. We're going to make that full list available in the online Web Admit Help Center next week. So if anything changes, it'll be pushed out live. Uh, you won't have to confer uh, a Word document to uh, find the latest updates. The uh, longer list, uh, the, the reason why we are only doing 10 is because the longer list includes many items that are really specific to WebAdmit and WebAdmit users, like, like a new session timeout that will automatically log out users that are inactive in WebAdmit. Knowing many of you that knowing that many of you aren't WebAdmit users, today we'll focus on reviewing those enhancements that were specifically requested by ACOMA stakeholders and may be applicable to all schools, regardless of what admission processing tool you use. So the first um, enhancement is we're updating the interest in osteopathic medicine answer questions or options. So every year we ask applicants. Uh, how they learned about osteopathic medicine. Last year, we updated those options and inadvertently left off the 
pre-health advisor faculty member option. So this year we're just adding it back. The second one is we're adding invited to interview and interviewed as decision codes. One of the strategic goals being pursued by ACOM this year is to provide our schools with predictive analytics to help better understand the applicant pool. Which applicants receive interviews is a key data point to be considered. However, it's not collected anywhere in ACOMA. So we're adding that as, as a, or those as a decision code, those uh, decision codes to better track the characteristics of students that may or may not have received interviews or may or may not have attended interviews. These are not final decision codes, but can be used throughout the cycle to track a student's progress through matriculation or otherwise. So the next um, is we're updating the ACOM certification statement. This is a smaller update, but one we did in response to an advisor request. One of the clauses in the previous certification statement made it sound as though students had to disclose within the, their personal statement the names of individuals who assisted in preparing the statement. Another clause made it sound as though it were a violation of our policies to use the statement for other applications. Um, those have been modified since we know students hopefully receive help from their free health advisors and may use the, their statement to apply to other services. We're also adding Pell Grant information to the application. This is added to better identify and understand applicants that may have come from disadvantaged backgrounds. One of the ways of assessing that status is by looking at applicants that were awarded Pell Grants to help further their, or to help fund their undergraduate education. So we're hoping this can assist in your holistic review. We're also um, allowing for post-submission edits to the advisor release. In many uh, cases, applicants do not realize that by answering no to the advisor release, their advisors can't see their information through the universal advisor portal or help them with their medical school application process. And applicants answer this question really at the start of the ACOMIS application process uh, before they're familiar with it and before they have enough information to really make an informed choice. So currently, if applicants do not answer yes to the advisor release, they can't change their answer once they submit. So this enhancement will allow students to go back in and release their application data to their advisors, even if they've already submitted their application. We're excited to roll this out because this has made advisors that we've spoken to already very happy. Um, and it allows, it just provides another communication tool between um, applicants and their advisors. We're also um, relabeling anywhere where it says fee assistance program as fee waiver program. Uh, we're doing this across the board, so outside of the ACOMOS application and inside. Previously, we used both of those terms interchangeably to talk about the same program. And we thought that might be confusing to applicants. So we just chose one that we thought best identified the program and described the program. And so that's going to be fee waiver program now. Uh, so number seven is provide ACOM with a decision history monthly, which means that all of the larger decision codes that your local statuses map up to, uh, we can pull a report of those on a monthly basis. So as stated earlier, one of our strategic goals is to use predictive analytics to better understand our applicant pool and what applicants will eventually matriculate to your school. So in order to do this, we need to see how applicants flow through various decisions throughout the course of the year. While this data is available to individual schools via WebAdmit or a, a WebAdmit report, it has not been available in aggregate form to ACOM. So we'll now be able to provide this data, or we will be provided this data on a monthly basis, which should give us a better understanding of our applicant pool prior to the final decisions reporting at the close of the cycle. Um, number eight is email applicants upon receipt of MCAT. So applicants to ACOMIS often wonder if medical schools have received their MCATs and they reach out to you and they reach out to ACOMIS customer service and they reach out to us. And this lack of clarity leads to a number of phone calls and unnecessary contacts. So while the check status page in ACOMIS tells applicants if an MCAT has arrived, it's a passive notification. So applicants aren't returning to that page daily after submission and aren't seeing that notification when it comes through. So this process improvement will hopefully reduce applicants' need to contact you and customer service and improve their user experience. And number nine is really related. It's the improved check status page for MCATs. So the screenshot there is actually what our application is currently and it isn't what the, um, we don't have images yet for what the improved check status page looks like. But along the same lines, um, 
there, you can see in that screenshot, there's no indicator. Uh, so there's indicators for transcripts and evaluations, but there's no indicator for MCAT scores. So the MCAT score indicator only appears after a performance has received official scores. In the upcoming cycle, the status page has been redesigned to make it easier for applicants to see if they have outstanding material. So the, the last and final um, update to the upcoming cycle, um, as you may remember, we reviewed uh, the gender identity uh, conversation with Kameo, the ACOMAS Advisory Committee, the Council on Diversity and Equity, the Council of Osteopathic Student Government Presidents, the AMC, and ACOM leadership. We are going to be adding two additional optional questions related to gender identity to ACOMAS this upcoming year. In addition to requiring an applicant sex, applicants will be able to optionally select or pronouns. Um, as a reminder that Jessica already talked about in order to, for us to uh, see what changes people want, we, we request it. And so this year, um, three different individuals asked ACOM to add gender identity to the ACOMAS application. A COM student, a DO physician and advocate, and a COM on the west coast of the U.S. So adding options for students to identify their gender provides an additional lens into the applicant's background when seeking to matriculate students from diverse backgrounds. Lastly, there is increasing research and resources on patient populations for sexual and gender minority health. Um, um, as a reminder, ACOM staff reviews and prioritizes all of our uh, all of our new questions with the ACOMAS Advisory Com Committee um, and move enhancements into production for the next application cycle. But because of the complexity of this question, we solicited feedback from all of Cameo in October. Um, at the time, you guys had no objection to this. We also asked Cameo liaisons to the CDE to review it. They were supportive of um, moving this question into the ACOMAS application. They did raise a few concerns about unconscious bias in the admissions process, uh, support structures in place to manage these students once they're on campus and lack of resources. Um, after conferring with uh, Dr. Spiker and Dr. Kane and CDE, um, our goal is that uh, the CDE next year, throughout this year, because these applicants um, won't identify until this cycle, uh, will hopefully come out with new resources there are a, a plethora of resources on the WMC page. And additionally, um, we know that many of these students are on your campuses. COSGP has already said that there are resources for them. So we are uh, pleased to introduce this for the next cycle. Um, changing uh, the conversation a little bit, um, as you may know, ACOMAS application fees are determined by the number of schools an applicant applies to. Applicants currently pay $195 for their first application and $45 for each additional designation. Applicants submit an average of 8.8 .8 designations. On an annual basis, we evaluate our ACOMAS fees to determine if we're meeting ACOM's revenue needs and the needs of our applicants. To evaluate these fees, we take in consideration the fee schedule from prior cycles, the application fees of our fellow FASHIP organizations, the impact on ACOM revenue, and the potential burden any change may place on applicants. Um, during the Board of Deans meeting in the spring of 2017, the board improved to increase the additional ACOMAS designation fee to $45 for the 2017 and 18 application cycle. They also approved several small increases to the application fees. However, ACOM subsequently did not raise fees for several years and has maintained a flat ACOMAS fee of 195 for the primary and 45 each additional designation for the past three consecutive cycles. This year, uh, we're taking to the board, we've already taken to the executive committee and we'll be taking to the entire board uh, next week that we're proposing a modest fee increase that would take effect over the next three years. The 2020-21 cycle that begins this May, we propose to increase each application by $1. So applicants would pay $196 for the primary and $46 for each additional designation. And so on, the next year would be $197 and additional fee by $2 to $48. And finally, with the 2022-23 cycle, 
applicants would pay an additional $1 for the primary and $2 each additional, each additional designation. So adding a, a bound to jail or, uh, and $2 each, each year. Uh, this fee increase would uh, increase ACOM revenue and provide added budgetary stability. As showed earlier, an increase in applicants is not guaranteed each year, and for many of our colleagues, it's not even expected in the near term. We also surveyed the market to compare ACOMAS fees with our fellow fashion organizations' application fees. The professions show here are sorted by primary application costs with the highest fees at the top. In this survey, we've included allopathic medicine, dentistry, vet med, podiatry, physician's assistants, pharmacy, and physical therapy. You can see ACOMAS has a relatively high primary application fee, but our additional application fee is actually comparatively low. AMC is the only organization listed that charges less than ACOMAS for additional applications. Applications fees increased since 2017 for ACOMAS, of course, have been very low compared to our FASHIP organizations. Our fee increase have increased by $5 since 2017, while other organizations like AMC increased $12, AACP by 25, and AA uh, and, and Vimcast by 40. Of the organizations listed here, fees increased by an average of $19, while ours increased by five. This data signaled to us that increasing application fees would actually align us with the practices of our fellow health profession organizations and, not, and would not be disruptive or out of the norm for our market. Finally, we, we assess the impact of the pro proposed fee increases would have on our applicants. We believe the additional financial burden would be ultimately low. Assuming applicants continue submitting 8.8 .8 designations, the first year would increase the applicant's total OCOMAS fees by about $8.80 or 1.61%. Over the next year, applicants would pay an additional $16 or just under 3%. This rate of increase corresponds approximately with the US inflation rate, which was at 2.3% in 2019. And we don't have any data showing total increases of the proposed $8 to $16 over three years would be a meaningful barrier to medical school for our students. And as a reminder to those that finances are a barrier, we have successfully provided fee waivers to all eligible applicants since 2017, thanks to the increase the board approved in the 2018 cycle. We also believe these increases could result in better services for prospective students and would, prove, would improve overall value. As stated earlier, over the past several years, we've developed new resources and services for prospective students, like ChooseDO.org, the ChooseDO Explorer, our searchable college database. Um, now I wanna get into some ACOMAS initiatives for future cycles. Um, distributing more ACOMAS fee waivers to all eligible students. So for the past two cycles, ACOM has offered up to $356,000 of fee waivers for eligible applicants based on the predetermined criteria, which is currently 200% of the US Department of Health and Human Services poverty guidelines based on family size. ACOM does not require applicants that are independent according to tax documentation to prefer further tax documentation of their periods, parents. After a thorough review of the program, it was determined that more than 60% of the examined awardees had a tax status of independent. However, the HRSA categories indicate that a large subset of these applicants may not truly be socioeconomically disadvantaged. The pi hypothesis is that because of their tax status and their current educational status qualifies them for the current cycle. ACOM will be changing the fee waiver program to not distinguish between independent and dependent status for the upcoming uh, application cycle. All applicants will have to provide tax documentation for their parents. There will be a limited amount of exceptions that will be managed directly through ACOM staff in the admissions department through Jessica and myself. Additionally, ACOM will add a new opt-in for fee waiver program awardees to share their award contact information with all ACOMAS participating comms so that should you choose to, you can recruit these students into your program. We also are looking to put out an ACOMAS participation statement in the next couple of years. Um, as you may know, uh, we currently don't have anything that um, articulates what ACOMAS provides to the schools and what the schools provide in return for having ACOMAS. 
Um, so some of the things on that participation agree, agreement that we are working on is to require all applicants um, that are applying for a DO degree that they must use um, the Comus application with the exception of Texas. And we'll require all applicants to use um, for the school and branch campus to which they are applying so that we get the correct information through a Comus. So if you have a branch campus or if you have a school, they have to apply and matriculate to the school or branch campus through a Comus. Uh, we also would require all acceptance decisions by May 15th, report all final actions by October 31st. We have some confidentiality agreement information in place to ensure that your, uh, your school is uh, uh, hosting the applicant data correctly and provide turnover information for access rights. We have several users in WebAdmit uh, through ACOMAS that are no longer employed by your institutions, yet still have active um, information in WebAdmit. So that would just um, let you guys know that you're required to provide that to us. So the formalized documentation of services for o ACOMAS provides, including those data, data entry needs and privacy needs from comms in return for ACOMAS services. So we'll be uh, sharing more of that uh, over the next couple months and as we meet with our board uh, to solidify the ACOMAS participation agreement. We also wanted to give you an update on the criminal background check uh, process. Again, as a review, there was a need identified by Cameo. ACOM looked it into the centralized criminal background check process. Many medical colleges uh, conduct those criminal background checks on applicants and matriculants to medical school in order to ensure these same students can obtain licensure in their state once medical school is complete. Over the past several years, we, we've been asked to take on this task of running criminal background checks to ease the burden of member medical schools, provide a consistent level of checks, and provide some level of transparency to applicants. In February 2019, we conducted a survey with you all to evaluate the current practices on criminal background checks and met with the board to discuss in November 2019. After reviewing the survey results of vendors, researching the cost models, and learning about the majority of health profession association CBC process, we are, uh, we are thinking we're going to enter a contract with Certify Incorporated for the application cycle 21-22, which is about a year from now. Certify has already contracted with all major APAs, has access to liaison's API, our ACOMAS vendor, and from a technical perspective, this would require minimal effort. We estimate that using this model above would cost around $375,000 for U.S. students and or around $25 to $35 per U.S. The timeline of the criminal background checks uh, would be procured on all applicants with an offer acceptance as of February 15th. As you may recall, we did a survey with you all and everyone said it was okay to run the criminal background checks in April, 2000, uh, April 15th. But we met with the board in November and they wanted that date moved up to February. We could also run checks on a subset of waitlist applicants as of June 1st of the application cycle if the school wants the checks run on their waitlisted candidates. Another board member didn't want criminal background checks run on their waitlisted candidates. So that's not a requirement, it's an option. The reason to trigger CVCs later in the application cycle is twofold allow for applicants that have more than one acceptance to both MD and DO programs to have made their decision on deciding which schools and reduce unnecessary costs for applicants or schools. For waitlisted candidates, again, you can start the process on up to 20% of your waitlist pool. If you accept a student that has already been accepted to another DO school after February 15th, you should immediately get those results in June. If not, it might take a couple weeks for that criminal background check to get back to you. So the, the conversation we're having with the deans in March is the cost structure. The first option is that applicants pay. We estimate again that this would cost between $25 and $35. Applicants would only pay one time regardless of the number of acceptances from comms each applicant has. And this can significantly reduce the cost they're currently paying where several comms might require payment for CBCs from a single applicant. Or the colleges pay through uh, ACOM. For U.S. applicants with an application status of accept or in some cases waitlist, ACOM could assume the fee 
and run it through uh, our institutions. This is very similar to the shared services agreement that many of your schools uh, uh, share now with, with the AAMC. So that's the conversation we're still having with the board in March to determine um, how they will be done um, and if we can come to a resolution of applicants pay or colleges pay, uh, we will work with you all to implement uh, the criminal background check centrally for the next application cycle. I do want to point out that I've had maybe two or uh, maybe two institutions contact me with concerns they've had with liaison customer service. And we're working through those with liaison. If you do have concerns, uh, I'm sorry, not liaison, with certify. If you do have concerns, many of you probably have other health professions that you run as well that you work with, cer uh, with certify. So if you have concerns or questions, I really would like that feedback um, so that we can ensure you don't run into the same trouble that you may with certify. I've also had very positive reaction to certify, but I did want to point out that I have had a couple of conversations with you all um, where there were some customer service questions. So the last question, um, or the last kind of slide before we uh, close out is that um, Jessica's going to share some polls, but we have a slight issue in the uh, fall 2020 Cameo meeting. Not only are we not being able to have it in person now, we know that um, OMED um, will be in Texas at the same exact time that UC Davis pre-health fair is happening, we know that many of you tried to go to both or tried to go to one. And so we're trying to understand what makes sense for uh, us in terms of a council meeting and us in terms of whether or not we should be at, um, uh, at OMED um, doing possibly another Choose DO Medical School Expo. Texas is a state that we have a strong amount of applicants that come from. Uh, we think it would help us to do a medical school expo while you are all there. But if you don't plan to be there, we don't know that it's worth spending the money on these events. So um, Jessica's gonna put out a poll, I think right now, to see Mayo, um, I'm sorry, who's going to UC Davis? And who's going to OMED, or maybe you're going to both, or maybe you have staff going to both. If you wouldn't mind filling out that poll um, on this call, that would be really helpful. <coughs> and Jamie, can you see the poll um, results as they come in? I can see them on my screen. I can, yes. Okay, perfect. And we're asking really just Cameo members, correct? I know we have some CSA folks on the phone. Yes, sorry, thanks, that's helpful. Perfect, so that the first question was, um, and this, you know, it's, we don't need exact, we were just trying to kind of gather, gather some feedback. Um, OMED, it looks like about 89% of the, about 16 out of 18 people are going to OMED. Um, and 10 out of 18 people are going to the UC Davis Fair. So it looks like OMED is a little bit more popular this year. Uh, for those of you that are on the call, of course, you know, this is kind of an informal poll just to kind of get your reactions to that. So the next question we wanna ask is, when would you rather hold the next Cameo meeting? Again, this is for Cameo only. Um, would you rather have it at OMED? Or is it something you'd like us to consider having at UC Davis instead if many of you plan to be there? Great, that's really helpful too. I, I'm kind of seeing the results that people still want to have the, the Cameo meeting at OMED. And then the last question is, um, if you are attending OMED, would you like to participate in a Choose DO Medical Expo, which is similar to the event we had in Atlanta and similar to the event we usually have at our Educating Leaders Conference? We see this as a perfect opportunity. I see no questions. I was going to keep speaking, but it looks like 100% of you would like to do a Choose DO Medical Expo. Um, perfect. So those were really our questions related to that meeting and we can go ahead and get started um, on some of, of, of that work to get you ready and hopefully, hopefully it won't be the first time you all see each other again, um, but that's, uh, 
that information is really helpful. So thank you for, for sharing and, and participating in the poll with us. We also thank you for spending the last hour of your uh, day uh, with us. And with that, we'd like to take any questions you may have. If you don't have questions now, we are happy. You can always email or call Jessica, Aaron, or myself, and we can answer any questions we have, um, you may have there. If you'd like to use the question and answer um, option, it should be on the bottom of your screen and or where you can mute yourself. We'll stay on for about five more minutes um, while we see those questions that, or as long as we see those questions answers coming in. Great question, um, which we should have mentioned, which was, will the presentation be available as a recording? And the answer is yes. We are going to record this and Jessica will make it live for you. Uh, we'll send out a link as well. And Jamie, I see two questions coming through the chat if you'd like to address those. Sure. Um, so one of the questions we have, um, okay, so the first question is, um, if we're going to need assistance um, from the comms at the NWHP at the advisor workshop, exhibit tables, et cetera, and we absolutely would like assistance. Aaron, <clears throat> Aaron will be sending out um, an email asking for participation uh, a little bit closer to the meeting. I don't know, Aaron, if you wanted to step in and answer that question of when you're going to be sending that out. Yeah, absolutely. Um, had it set an exact date in mind, but definitely will be at least two months prior to NWHB happening. Great. Um, so about two months prior to NWHP, we'll ask for assistance and we'd love as many of you that would like to volunteer, we'll try to make room for you. Um, the next question was a great question that I probably should have answered is, could a criminal background check be run after February for late offers? So the answer is yes. So, so we will, any, anybody that you have accepted up until February, no criminal background checks will be run until that February 15th date. After February 15th, every time there's a trigger in WebInmit that you've made an offer, it will automatically generate a process for the applicant to begin that criminal background check process. So it, it basically holds and stores those acceptance officers uh, off offers in WebInmit until that February 15th date, at which we'll release all of that information to certify. The applicants will have to log in, give approval, review their criminal background check, and then they'll send it back to, and, and then they'll send it through certify back to you. Anytime after February 15th, so if someone's accepted on March 1st, April 1st, May 1st, that then triggers the same process, but it's live rather than holding and queuing them until uh, you know, until another date. Hopefully that answers your question, Leanne, but I'm happy to take that offline as well or answer more questions related to that. Uh, the other question is, do you have any anticipated date for the Choose DO edits for the upcoming cycle to be open? And I think I think the person is referring to um, the Choose DO um, Explorer um, if they have updates that they've made uh, through the survey that our MARCOM team put out. Um, and those updates should already be available on Choose Geo Explorer. Erin, do you have any further um, answers to that question? Yeah, great question. Um, I will check in with our MARCOM team and ensure that they've been updated, but I was told that they would be updated prior to educating leaders. Um, which would have been March 25th. Um, so we'll ensure that those are up to date. Um, the next question is another good one. So if we accept a student July 1st, we get the most updated background check. And if that student was accepted by another school, they receive an update. 
Um, I don't have that exact answer for you yet, Jamie. I know that uh, when I worked with Certify in the past, that was the case, that if someone, they, they would only run the check from the time that, um, you know, so uh, here's a, just a scenario. If the applicant was um, accepted on, on March 1st to one institution, um, that they would, get the app, they would get the criminal background check on March 1st for everything that happened till March 1st. If another school accepted them on June 1st, they would rerun the process only from March to June. So you could get updates on that March to June and then you would see, yes, you would see the updates. That's a very good question that you ask about whether or not the original school would receive an update. I need to check with Certify on that and I can get back to you. Um, Jamie, on how that works right now uh, with their other vendors. Are there other questions, feedback? All right, well, um, we do wanna remind you that uh, we have another webinar in April. I think right now we are scheduled to have Tony Wynn from NAHP talk about the latest and greatest of what's going on. Um, and we are excited to continue having these. And please, again, if you have any feedback or ideas that you want us to touch on or talk about um, for future webinars, uh, send those to us and we'll try to get them, them scheduled. Again, we're sorry we won't see many of you in a couple of weeks, but we hope that you stay safe. Um, and uh, that's all for today. So have a, a wonderful day.